like most of you, I'm a Swift developer. I make apps, as Daniel said, for the Mac. I also work with iOS. But unlike a lot of you, I have a long history working with Objective-C. And my apps are a mix of both Objective-C and Swift. So naturally, it's very interesting and important to me that I understand the interface between Objective-C and Swift in the system. But I think, regardless of what your circumstances are, it's also important to some degree that you also understand that interface. Um, and you will benefit from knowing just enough Objective-C to suit your needs. Now, since Swift debuted, a lot of people have been talking about this idea of a pure Swift app. And a lot of people love to proudly say that their app is pure Swift. And whenever I hear this, it jangles a little bit because I know nobody's app on iOS, on the Mac, most of Apple's platforms, nobody's app can be pure Swift. Apple's platforms are implemented overwhelmingly in Objective-C, so you interface with Apple's Objective-C code all the time, and uh, the idioms from these years, decades even, of Objective-C API design impact the way we write, debug, and design our apps. So to illustrate this point, I have a very simple iOS app here. It's so simple, it consists of two source files, and you can see them both in a single slide. It's an almost non-functional application delegate um, and a view controller that is not a massive view controller. It is quite simple, really, if you look at it. All it does is when view did appear is reached, it presents an alert panel. Hello, Objective-C, it is nice to meet you. And that's the attitude I would like you to have as we go into this talk, because some of you are on good speaking terms with Objective-C, and some of you maybe have been afraid to ever say a word, maybe because you feel like you don't know the language, and um, you might be getting in over your head. But like all of us in this room speaking English today, we may all have a common language in common, just like we all have Swift in common, but we are situated in a location that is not overwhelmingly English. Outside the walls of this theater, everybody around us is speaking French. Our Swift apps are kind of like this, except that they live in a world that is overwhelmingly Objective-C. So just as when you travel to another country, it's important to open your ears and listen to what the people sound like when they're speaking in the native language, I think it's also true that it would be beneficial for those of you who are writing pure Swift apps to open your ears to the sound of Objective-C on the platforms you work with. This is an exercise you can try later with your own app. Um, I think it's illustrative of how much Objective-C is involved in even the most basic iOS app. Set a breakpoint on obj-c message send. This is a function that's part of the Objective-C runtime. It's a critical central function. And in Xcode, you can set an action to perform every time a breakpoint is hit. Set this action to display the string that the second argument to the function represents. When you build and run, open the console in Xcode, and you will see line after line after line of Objective-C message send getting hit in your app, even this very, very simple app. In fact, I gave up waiting after it had done over 150,000 calls, just trying to bring up that simple app that I showed you. I don't know how many Swift calls there were, but it was a lot less than 150,000. So what is Objective-C message send, and why is it so important to our pure Swift apps? It's fundamental to the design of Objective-C, um, and I think it's important that you understand how it works. The good news is it's open source, so you can go to opensource.apple.com and learn exactly how it works. Unfortunately, it's implemented in highly tuned assembly code for every platform that Apple supports. There's even a special version for the simulator. So I'm going to try to explain it on a very high level that hopefully fits within 18 minutes. And to start with, I want you to understand what method selectors are. Method selectors is a term you will hear over and over if you're listening to people talk about Objective-C. And at a very high level, it's an abstract idea. It's an arbitrary selector that um, is, a, is a bit of data that represents to an object what function it should perform. 
So when you send a method selector to an object, you're sort of asking the object to do something without literally calling any function or any method on the object. To make that clearer, in the context we're concerned about, they're really just strings. On Apple's platforms, overwhelmingly, they're plain C strings, in fact. So what we were printing out in that simple example were the C strings that represent the method selectors to all of those 150,000 plus objective C calls that are made just to get your app running. If we look at one in particular, this is a call to probably NS array. This is the objective C code up top that the compiler, the objective C compiler would take this, derive the method selector from it, and then translate it, not just essentially, but actually into a plain C call to objective C message send. So just to drive this home a little bit, the big high-level difference between Swift, or one of them, is that Swift tends to aim for a static dispatch, which means that it knows at compile time where the implementation of a particular function or method is. So you can think of a line like this in Swift as the Swift compiler effectively knowing the address in memory and baking it into your app so that it knows how to pass arguments to a specific address in memory and a method is implemented or is, is performed. Objective-C, on the other hand, does not even know at compile time whether the method is going to exist at runtime. It's one of the great powers of Objective-C, and it's one of the great pitfalls. So everything in Objective-C compiles down to one of these obc um, message send, or, or, uh, or a relative of it, and its job is to work in conjunction with the object that's being messaged to find an implementation for the method represented by the method selector. If it finds it, it copies the address, calls, it, calls to it, just the same way Swift would, but it's all done at runtime. So that's interesting, maybe. I don't know, maybe it's not interesting. Who cares, anyway? You make pure Swift apps. The truth is, uh, Apple's Swift compiler handles most of this interaction for you. But that's not really what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is the possibility that you're going to run into edge cases where Apple doesn't handle it for you, and how much more, how much better equipped you'll be to handle that if you start poking around with Objective-C. The main thing you have to keep in mind with Swift and Objective-C is anything that needs to be made available to Objective-C, the Swift compiler has to basically write a wrapper function around it. This boilerplate code is implemented for you whenever you add at obj-c to a property or to a function. And some of you have probably done this. Maybe you did this because you knew exactly what it was for, or maybe you did it because somebody just said, try this. Um, that works. That's no judgment. Um, but a lot of times, you don't even have to think about it because the Swift compiler implicitly generates this boilerplate code for you in all of these circumstances where it can tell definitively that you want a, uh, an Objective-C-based interface. Now, the thing to keep in mind is all this code gets compiled into your app. So you actually have all this Objective-C interfacing app uh, code compiled in. For example, in our UI view controller subclass, this view did appear method would not be reachable by Objective-C if it weren't for the Swift implicit generation of Objective-C interfacing code. And that happens in this case because we're overriding an Objective-C method. So what we get is something like this. Um, this is code that's compiled into my simple app. It exposes an Objective-C entry point, and then it basically just translates everything from Objective-C idioms into Swift idioms and then calls through to the native method. So one thing I want to point out about that at obj-c annotation is you can put a method selector name, basically, in the parentheses, and you have control over exactly how anything in Swift that's annotated in this way is exposed to the Objective-C runtime. A very common use case for this is to prevent namespace collision in Objective-C. So you know now that Objective-C uses method selectors, which are just strings, and that's how it determines with which functionality to perform. Now, a problem with this is if you extend a class like UIView, if I add a, a new fancy method 
to UI view. And then sometime down the road, Apple adds a, a fancy method, or I use a third-party framework and they add a fancy method. Now all of our methods are conflicting, and the Objective-C runtime does not know how to determine which is the most ideal one to call. So a trick for years on Objective-C land has been to prefix method names, and you can do this easily with the at c annotation. If you are extending a class that you do not control, you need to add obj-c prefixes to avoid collision if you have Objective-C clients. So we've talked a little bit about outgoing call or about incoming calls, making your methods and functions and properties available to Objective C. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the inverse. Sometimes you want to make calls from Swift specifically to Objective C. Sometimes you don't want to, but you are anyway, because like I said, we live in an Objective C world. So for example, back to our simple presentation code. This call to self.present looks like pure Swift. And you would be forgiven for thinking that it calls some Swift API on the framework or in the system that implements what you expect it to. But when you compile this code, it doesn't generate a Swift dispatch. And I'm going to show you one little cool trick in Xcode. You can use, again, prove this to yourself. Um, if you go to the Xcode debug menu, and then the debug workflow submenu, you can enable this always show disassembly. And what this does is when you're broken at a, at a breakpoint in Xcode, even if it knows the source code for your app, it will show you instead the disassembly for that code. So if I break at self.present in my view controller, this is what I see. There is a call to Objective C message send right there in my pure Swift app and it's passing a C string, the present view controller uh, method selector. So um, knowing a little bit about this, it can be really useful to, to use this to do things like calling private methods. Now the Apple people in the audience might be screaming, don't do that, don't call private methods. And they're absolutely right, don't do that except for when you do. And a really good excuse for doing that is when you're debugging. And in particular, there are Apple-provided debugging mechanisms, like UIView implements a recursive description method that gives you a string-based dump of your view's hierarchy. In this situation, you might want to, say, try to debug a view problem by printing the view hierarchy in view did appear. And in this example, I've tried to do just that by accessing the recursive description as a property. Swift says, uh-uh, there is no recursive description on UI view. I should know because I'm Swift. I know everything. And I happen to know different, but there's no getting around it, right? There is getting around it, and you can use the fact that Swift exposes NS objects perform family of uh, functions. And the simplest form of that is just to say self view perform, pass a method selector, recursive description in this case, and it works. I get my console dump when I run the app. Now, this is well and good if you're just doing a quick trick, but um, I want to encourage you to use bridging headers to facilitate this kind of stuff in a cleaner way. Most of us think of bridging headers as a way to import any legacy Objective-C headers we have in our own app but it's also an opportunity to completely reshape how Swift sees the Objective-C landscape in your app. So for example, I want to go back to my nicer, in my opinion, invocation of recursive description. And to do that, I'm going to add something to my bridging header. It's, a, it's flagged with an if debug. It's not too dangerous. I'll never ship this code, I think. Um, but if I just add property recursive description to UI view, that's good enough for Swift. Swift is so inflexible in some ways. And then if you just put it in the bridging header and say, this is, just trust me, this is how Objective-C works, it's like, fine, OK. Self-view recursive description works now, and I can build and run my app with no errors and get the expected outcome. I've sort of already told you a few weird tricks. So, but this is the one. This is the one weird trick that I think you will appreciate 
whether you are interested in Swift or not, whether you are interested in Objective-C or not, if you're interested in both. The only way you might not be interested in this is if you already know about it, I guess, or if you really are, you walked in off the street and found the wrong room. I don't know. You're not supposed to be using Xcode. You don't debug apps. You don't build apps. And to illustrate this trick, I want you to imagine that you are debugging a problem in view did appear where, for whatever reason, this self.present doesn't seem to be working. A reasonable thing to do as a debugger is to set a breakpoint on the target of that method to see if it ever gets reached or not. If it doesn't get reached, we know where to look for the problem. But um, it can be really hard as a Swift developer to know what the actual symbol is for the method you're calling. Um, now, if Apple had implemented this in Swift, it would still be hard, because to get LLDB to set breakpoints on Swift methods, you really have to accommodate its understanding of all the types of the parameters. This isn't necessary in Objective-C. But I think if Apple had implemented this in Swift, this would work. Of course, it doesn't work. No locations pending. That's what, that's what LLDB says when you totally fail to set a breakpoint. So I'm going to take another swing at this using a trick that I think most of you have probably never heard of, which is regex breakpoints. This is a trick in LLDB where you can set a breakpoint based on a regular expression, an arbitrary string that will be evaluated against the list of all the symbols in your app. That includes system frameworks, private symbols, your symbols, everything, Objective-C, Swift. So in this case, in examples like this, I just kind of try to take a few little bits from what I expect the method selector to look like. In this case, I say, ah, I think it's in UI view. Probably has present in it. Probably has anim in it. And it says, oh, I got eight locations. It's kind of surprising it's that many, but there's a lot of internal private methods that are supporting this functionality. But if I zoom in on the one down there that looks like the most public version, I can see exactly. I could set a breakpoint on that specifically, or I can just continue because it's already been set. There are other cool tricks with this. That one with the brackets attempts to set a breakpoint on every symbol that has starts with a dash and has brackets, left bracket and a right bracket, which is, some of you know, every Objective-C method implementation. 270,000 in my simple app. Uh, also, sometimes I use this to explore the possibility of debug functions that might exist. Sometimes Apple has great debug functionality that they've never gotten around to documenting, or they have you know, maybe mentioned in an old 2010 WWDC talk. And sometimes I just browse for fun stuff, like what, how many methods work with emoji on the system. So I do think it's worth striving for pure Swift in our apps. There's a lot of value to having consistency across all of the source code in a source base. As I work on my stuff, I'm converting stuff from Objective-C to Swift as it makes sense. And I look forward to having a quote unquote pure Swift app. But I hope I've demonstrated in this talk that there are reasons, even if you're in that situation, to poke around at Objective-C, to get familiar, to learn to say a few words in the language, because I think you'll enjoy your time living in this Objective-C world that we live in for the time being a lot more if you do. If you've enjoyed this topic and you want to learn some more, I recommend these two WWDC talks. They're a little bit old, but they're oldies but goodies, I guess, as they say. And um, don't overlook the Swift documentation for attributes. That's where you'll learn a lot about the at obc attribute and a bunch of other attributes that should be useful to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>